I looked, and the unseen figure, which still grasped me by the wrist, had caused to be thrown open the graves of all mankind, and from each issued the faint phosphoric radiance of decay, so that I could see into the innermost recesses, and there view the shrouded bodies in their sad and solemn slumbers with the worm. But alas, the real sleepers were fewer, by many millions, than those who slumbered not at all. And there was a feeble struggling, and there was a general and sad unrest, and from out the depths of the countless pits there came a melancholy rustling from the garments of the buried, and out of those who seemed tranquilly to repose I saw a vast number had changed, in a greater or less degree, the rigid and uneasy position in which they had originally been entombed. And the voice again said to me as I gazed, Is it not, oh, is it not a pitiful sight? But before I could find words to reply, the figure had ceased to grasp my wrist, the phosphoric lights expired, and the graves were closed with a sudden violence, while from out them rose a tumult of despairing cries, saying again, Is it not, O oh God, is it not a very pitiful sight? Fantasies such as these, presenting themselves at night, extended their terrific influence far into my waking hours. My nerves became thoroughly unstrung, and I fell a prey to perpetual horror. I hesitated to ride or to walk or to indulge in any exercise that would carry me from home. In fact, I no longer dared trust myself out of the immediate presence of those who were aware of my proneness to catalepsy, lest falling into one of my usual fits I should be buried before my real condition could be ascertained. I doubted the care, the fidelity of my dearest friends. I dreaded that in some trance of more than customary duration they might be prevailed upon to regard me as irrecoverable. I even went so far as to fear that, as I occasioned much trouble, they might be glad to consider any very protracted attack as sufficient excuse for getting rid of me altogether. It was in vain they endeavored to reassure me by the most solemn promise, solemn promises. I exacted the most sacred oaths that under no circumstances they would bury me until decomposition had so materially advanced as to render further preservation impossible, and even then my mortal terrors would listen to no reason, would accept no consolation. I entered into a series of elaborate precautions. Among other things, I had the family vault so remodeled as to admit of being readily opened from within. The slightest pressure upon a long lever that extended far into the tomb would cause the iron portals to fly back. There were arrangements also for the free admission of air and light, and convenient receptacles for food and water, within immediate reach of the coffin intended for my reception. This coffin was warmly and softly padded, and was provided with a lid fashioned upon the principle of the vault door, with the addition of springs so contrived that the feeblest movement of the body would be sufficient to set it at liberty. Besides all this, there was, there was suspended from the roof of the tomb a large bell, the rope of which it was designed should extend through a hole in the coffin, and so be fastened to one of the hands of the corpse. But alas, what avails the vigilance against the destiny of man? Not even these well-contrived securities sufficed to save from the uttermost agonies of living inhumation a wretch to these agonies foredoomed. There arrived an epoch, as often before there had arrived, in which I found myself emerging from total unconsciousness into the first feeble and indefinite sense of existence. Slowly, with a tortoise gradation, approached the faint gray dawn of the physical day, a torpid uneasiness, an apathetic endurance of dull pain, no care, no hope, no effort. Then, after a long interval, a ringing in the ears, then after a lapse still longer, a prickling or tingling sensation in the extremities, then a seemingly eternal period of pleasurable quiescence, during which the awakening feelings are struggling into thought, then a brief resinking into non-entity, then a sudden recovery. At length, the slight quivering of an eyelid, and immediately thereupon, an electric shock of a terror, deadly and indefinite, which sends the blood in torrents from the temples to the heart. 
and now the first positive effort to think, and now the first endeavor to remember, and now a partial and evanescent success, and now the memory has so far regained its dominion that in some measure I am cognizant of my state. I feel that I am not awaking from ordinary sleep. I recollect that I have been subject to catalepsy, and now at least, as if by the rush of an ocean, my shuddering spirit is overwhelmed by the one grim danger, by the one spectral and ever-prevalent idea. For some minutes, after this fancy possessed me, I remained without motion. And why? I could not summon courage to move. I dared not make the effort which was to satisfy me of my fate. And yet there was something at my heart which whispered me it was sure. Despair, such as no other species of wretchedness ever calls into being, despair alone urged me, after long irresolution, to uplift the heavy lids of my eyes. I uplifted them. It was dark. All dark. I knew that the fit was over. I knew that the crisis of my disorder had long passed. I knew that I had now fully recovered the use of my visual faculties. And yet it was dark, all dark. The intense and utter raylessness of the night that endureth evermore. I endeavored to shriek, and my lips and my parched tongue moved convulsively together in an attempt, but no voice issued from the cavernous lungs, which oppressed as if by the weight of some incumbent mountain gasped and palpitated with the heart at every elaborate and struggling inspiration. The movement of the jaws in this effort to cry aloud showed me that they were bound up, as is usual, with the dead. I felt, too, that I lay upon some hard substance, and by something similar my sides were also closely compressed. So far I had not ventured to stir any of my limbs, but now I violently threw up my arms, which had been lying at length, with the wrists crossed. They struck a solid wooden substance, which extended above my person at an elevation of not more than six inches from my face. I could no longer doubt that I reposed within a coffin at last. And now, amid all my infinite miseries, came sweetly the cherub hope, for I thought of my precautions. I writhed, writhed, and made spasmodic exertions to force open the lid. It would not move. I felt my wrists for the bell rope. It was not to be found. And now the comforter fled forever, and still and a still sterner despair reigned triumphant, for I could not help perceiving the absence of the paddings which I had so carefully prepared. And then, too, there came suddenly to my nostrils the strong peculiar odor of moist earth. The conclusion was irresistible. I was not within the vault. I had fallen into a trance while absent from home, while among strangers, when or how I could not remember, and it was they who had buried me as a dog, nailed up in some common coffin, and thrust deep, deep, and forever into some ordinary and nameless grave. As this awful conviction forced itself thus into the innermost chambers of my soul, I once again struggled to cry aloud, and in this second endeavor I succeeded. A long, wild, and continuous shriek or yell of agony resounded through the realms of the subterranean night. Hello? Hello there, said a gruff voice in reply. What the devil's the matter now, said a second. Get out of that, said a third. What do you mean by yowling in that ear kind of style like a catty-mount, said a fourth. And hereupon I was seized and shaken without ceremony, for several minutes by a junto of very rough-looking individuals. They did not arouse me from my slumber, for I was wide awake when I screamed, but they restored me to full possession of my memory. This adventure occurred near Richmond, in Virginia. Accompanied by a friend, I had proceeded upon a gunning expedition some miles down the banks of the, of the James River. Night approached, and we were overtaken by a storm. The cabin of a small sloop lying at anchor in the stream and laden with garden mold afforded us the only available shelter. We made the best of it and passed the night on board. I slept in one of the only two berths in the vessel, and the berths of a sloop are sixty or seventy tons a sloop of sixty or seventy tons need scarcely be described. That which I occupied had no bedding of any kind, 
Its extreme width was 18 inches. The distance of its bottom from the deck overhead was precisely the same. I found it a matter of exceeding difficulty to squeeze myself in. Nevertheless, I slept soundly, and the whole of my vision, for it was no dream, and no nightmare, arose naturally from the circumstances of my position, from my ordinary bias of thought, and from the difficulty to which I have alluded, of collecting my senses, and especially of regaining my memory. For a long time after awaking from slumber, the men who shook me were the men who shook me were the crew of the sloop, and some laborers engaged to unload it. From the load itself came the earthy smell, the bandage about my jaws. The bandage about the jaws was a silk handkerchief in which I had bound up my head in default of my customary nightcap. The tortures endured, however, were indubitably quite equal for the time to those of actual sepulture. They were fearfully, they were inconceivably hideous. But out of evil proceeded good, for their very excess wrought in my spirit an inevitable revulsion. My soul acquired tone, acquired temper. I went abroad, I took vigorous exercise, I breathed the free air of heaven. I thought upon other subjects than death. I discarded my medical books. Who can I burned? I read no night thoughts, no fustian about churchyards, no bugaboo tales such as this. In short, I became a new man, and lived a man's life. From, the, from that memorable night I dismissed forever my charnel apprehensions, and from them vanished the cataleptic disorder, of which perhaps they had been less the consequence than the cause. There are moments when, even to the sober eye of reason, the world of our sad humanity may assume the semblance of a hell, but the imagination of man is no catharsis to explore with impunity its every cavern. Alas, the grim legion of sepulchral terrors cannot be regarded as altogether fanciful, but like the demons in whose company Afrasiab made his voyage down the Oxus, they must sleep, or they will devour us, they must be suffered to slumber, or we perish.